Jesus is about the kingdom of God, a, a way of living now and forever based on loving God and loving others as our highest priorities, the two rules by which everything else must be guided. Yet sometimes we take Jesus' teaching and try to create rules that are applied outside of those guiding principles. And that's where we run into a problem. And kind of in that context, I want to look at this passage, Mark chapter 10, verses 2 through 16. And here's how Mark relates this. Some Pharisees came, and to test him, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote the commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is, such as, it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Okay, divorce is not an easy topic ever. It, not at all. And these guys, they don't bring up this difficult topic hoping to learn something and to grow. They are hoping to cause problems. They want to trip Jesus up, maybe cause some controversy, and you have to remember that when you read through this passage. So they ask if divorce is lawful. And they know that divorce is one of those questions that really has no good answer. It's, it's, it's something that is just too painful. And they already know that it is lawful. And Jesus is well aware of the fact that they know it's lawful. So he points the question back to them. And they immediately refer to Moses. And they would just love it if Jesus would disagree with the teaching of Moses. They could immediately go tell everyone that Jesus was teaching people to disobey the laws of scripture. Jesus has this tendency though to go from the law back to the heart and to the intention. He insists that Moses was only given these commandments on divorce because God knew how messed up their hearts were. So it was allowed, but his point is that it was never what God intended. So understand Scriptural divorce was serious, especially serious, because of the patriarchal culture in which they lived. Men had all the rights in a marriage once it took place. The woman had to be given a certificate of divorce if the husband threw her out because she couldn't even go back to her family, even if they were willing to take her in because she was basically her husband's property. She had to be able to prove that he divorced her even to go to her own family. And even if she had a legitimate certificate of divorce, she still could not work and could not own property. So divorced women often became beggars or prostitutes just in order to survive. And that was done to them with one little piece of paper. And, and it was a mess. By the time of Jesus, the real debate was just over what a man could divorce a woman for because you have to understand a woman could not divorce a man it just wasn't it wasn't in the law it wasn't allowed it wasn't possible so some teachers said why can a man divorce his wife some said only because of adultery it had to be very serious on the other end of that spectrum there were those who said burning dinner was enough or being less desirable even than another woman maybe so do you begin to see what jesus meant by hardness of heart you know i kind of get it and let this change even how you look in John's gospel and read the narrative of the woman at the well. She had gone through five husbands and was living with a guy. And some of us were taught to hear that and think, sinner. Well, what about the reality of being thrown out five times with nowhere to go? 
And finally, just living with a guy who was willing to take her in. And, and that's when you have to stop and go, we're not sure whether we want to look at her as sinner or just understand her as victim. Because sometimes grace can be about forgiveness and a new start. But sometimes grace can also be about hope and the potential for a future that was never dreamed of before. Jesus is dreaming himself of something better than the mess, the brokenness that they all knew so well. He was dreaming of the kingdom of God, and it has a different set of rules. Jesus looks to creation, male and female, created for union, created by God for that union, with the intent that such a union would last. It's the vision of a kingdom ideal. Divorce is still lawful. Jesus doesn't deny the law. He just paints a picture of a kingdom ideal that is more, that is better. Interpret more in what Jesus hopes for as women not being tossed out to be homeless and in poverty. When divorce leads to tragedy, poverty, and despair for women, Jesus and later Paul's teachings about divorce take on a whole new and a much bigger light. So often we miss all this. In, in fact, often churches have used Jesus' words in this passage it, it, without any thought to context just to make some new laws. You have church where no divorce is allowed. You have some that tell people that as Christians, if they've been through a divorce years ago, they, that they really need to leave their current wife and go unite with the first wife. You have churches where divorce for any reason disqualifies you from ministry. You know, and I have to admit, we've been there too. At one time, it was easier in the Church of the Nazarene to be a pastor if you had been a murderer than it was if you had ever been divorced. So isn't it funny that we never took Jesus' words about selling everything you have and giving to the poor and made that a law in the church? The disciples asked for more help once they get away from the adversarial types. And it, then Jesus just carries it a lot further. He says that if either spouse divorces the other to marry someone else, they commit adultery against the first spouse. Okay, this is huge. Because once again, we, we used to this to make laws and miss the radical thing that Jesus was saying here. It's where he starts in that. He gave the woman the same rights here as the man. They were used to a law where a woman could commit adultery against her husband, but she had no right to ever claim that he had committed adultery against her because she basically had no rights. So if he slept with someone else's wife, then, then that woman's husband could claim that his rights were violated, but that violator's wife had no actual rights to claim anything. So Jesus' statement, when he says what he says, and he starts with the woman's rights first, he gave each spouse equal standing. This is why when you read the, the account of this in Matthew 19, and Jesus says it there, the disciples respond, if such is the case of a man and his wife, it is better not to marry. See, they said that because they were used to a world in which a man in a marriage had the right to do whatever he wanted. Jesus said that wasn't the world he represented, and they were shaken. I'm guessing they told the guy who brought this back up, you don't get to ask Jesus questions anymore. Is, is it really any wonder that Jesus uses the phrase hardness of heart when he talks about this stuff? The kingdom of God is supposed to just be a better place than this. That's what Jesus is about. When we make divorce the second unforgivable sin, we are kind of leaning toward being just as hard-hearted. Jesus has an ideal about what marriage should be like, and it should be fair and kind and compassionate and lasting. And admittedly, they don't all turn out that way. Not everyone in every marriage is a citizen of the kingdom of God, and things get messy. Paul understood this because Paul went out there to a world. He got outside of the Jewish society where most people at least were somewhat religious and had some faith in their life. And he went out there into the, the mess and had to take the teachings and the dreams of Jesus and the message of the kingdom and give it broader application. And, and some people resist that. For instance, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says that if an unbeliever wants out of a marriage to a believer, 
the believer is not bound. And that's pretty radical language. Not bound seems to mean set free, though it's amazing to hear people try to wiggle around that. Jesus, he accepted the woman at the well with all her past and all she had been through, and he looked toward a new future for her. There was to be grace and hope and streams of living water coming up with a life that was once broken in so many ways by so many people. And then th this woman, who obviously came to the well at a time when no one else was going to be there, the worst time of the day, so she wouldn't have to face anyone else in her community, she goes back to that same community to bring them to Jesus. There are no chains put on her by Jesus, just acceptance and a new life. Jesus already knows that not every marriage is the ideal and not everything works out. And he offered grace and he offered healing. It, it all has to be the opposite of hard-hearted. Though the, the disciples, admittedly, are a little bit slow on the uptake. I mean, the next thing they do, according to Mark, is to try to keep children away from Jesus. Jesus finds this incredibly annoying. They see G children as being of little worth, the ones who aren't important enough, who should just stay back. Jesus insists that these children that are seemingly insignificant have nothing to contribute or actually what disciples need to be like. Humble and dependent like a child on the grace of God. Seeking Jesus with all their, their heart. Those are the ones who get his blessing. The ones who come humbly and begging and seeking and hoping. Now, how dependent do we need to be on God's grace? Jesus just keeps raising heart issues. He gives equal, white, or equal rights in marriage. He's also the same guy that says, if you have ever even looked at someone inappropriately, you are guilty of adultery. His ideals are pretty tough. He also says, if your eye ever does anything like that, just looking at a person inappropriately and offend you, you need to rip that sucker out. So why is it that we only make rules out of the one statement on divorce? Maybe the, the one really honest moment, maybe the most honest moment in the gospel is in 1026 of Mark, when the disciples finally throw up their hands after hearing so much of all this and say, then who can even be saved? It's their we give up moment. And that's not a bad thing. Jesus' enemies keep wanting him to make someone angry. And he just keeps taking Moses' teaching and raising the stakes, applying it to the heart, and asking for more than we could ever imagine to be humanly possible. So how does Jesus answer the hopeless question? Who can be saved if it takes all of this? And that's the whole point. No one can. No one can save themselves. No one can get themselves to the point of being saved. It requires God to do what we cannot do. And that's when, like little children, who need someone to do for them what they cannot do for themselves, to take care of them, to provide for them, to protect them. Jesus says, don't despise them for being dependent. Learn to be like them, being dependent upon the grace and the love and the life and heart-changing power of God. Not everything works out. I, I've seen Jesus-loving Christian people who had to leave a spouse who was violent to the point of life-threatening. I believe Jesus has nothing but grace and love and hope, the hope of something better for that person. With the kingdom, Jesus takes questions and changes the issue from what is lawful or desirable to what's possible only by the grace of God. Relationships where people are cared about, where they are valued, where love is the ultimate guide to action. We don't change ourselves because we will never make it. We come like children, and we just let him change us. And that's when all things become possible. Can we pray? God, sometimes we want to just pull a rule out of something and feel like we justified ourselves and it's all okay. The more we get into this, the more we see 
your son just keeps showing us something beyond what we could ever do in and of ourselves. And, and it has to keep moving us to the point that it breaks us and we say, what can we do? How could we ever get there? And when we reach that point, that's when we're ready to say we never will. And we have to give up on what we can do and turn to you like children and ask for what only you can do. So God, help us to be dependent upon you. Help us to completely open ourselves up to what only you can do in our hearts and then through our lives. God, we try so hard, and sometimes we just want to do it all ourselves. This passage, it's not about pulling out one piece and making a rule. It's about looking at all of it and realizing how hard it is to be the people that you dream of us becoming. But that's why you died, so that you could do it for us, in us, through us. Help us to want all that you give. Help us to find grace and forgiveness and healing in you that we might find the new life that is created by you, empowered and made possible by you when we let you do for us what we could never do for ourselves. Help us to find that, to let you fully into our hearts, and then to find fully what you can do in our hearts, through our hearts, and with our lives. Just like that woman, that one day, her past did not matter, but you gave her a new future. That's what was most important. Help us to see that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to end with the first three verses of Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. To make that our blessing for this week. May you find in the living Jesus the ultimate revelation of God in your life. May you find that the same Jesus who holds the universe together is the one holding your life together each day. Finally, may you find that Jesus has connected you to God the Father, and he is there speaking for you to the Father every time you need him.